Hi, my name's Julie and I'm one of the teachers at Hope Center for the Arts. Right now, one of the classes we're having so much fun with, I call Story and Conversation. We're reading the entire Narnia series and we are on book number five entitled The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Now, some of the artists bring their own book to class and read along with us, with me. Others are uh, just listening. You'll see some are on their exercise bikes, others are eating breakfast, it's all good. We are just loving going there in our imagination. So I thought it would be fun to post the videos of this so that if anybody misses one of the classes, they can catch up online. But also if you, anybody who's not a artist at Hope Center for the Arts, you can practice your reading skills and read along with us. So I know there are a few different um, editions. Uh, this one, I think you can go by, this is where you can judge a book by its cover. Ha, get it? Sorry, that's bad. All right, so this is what the book looks like that I'm reading. The Chronicles of Narnia are written by C.S. Lewis. And let's begin. Here is the picture for chapter one, the picture in the bedroom. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. His parents called him Eustace, Eustace Clarence, and masters called him Scrub. Masters in England are the school professors or teachers. I can't tell you how his friends spoke to him, for he had none. He didn't call his father and mother father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians, non-smokers, and teetotalers, and wore a special kind of underclothes. That's underwear. In their house, there was a very little furniture and very few clothes on the beds, and the windows were always open. Eustace Clarence liked animals, especially beetles, if they were dead and pinned on a card. He liked books if they were books of information and had pictures of grain elevators or of fat foreign children doing exercises in model schools. Eustace Clarence disliked his cousins, the, the four Hevenses, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. But he was quite glad when he heard that Edmund and Lucy were coming to stay. For deep down inside him, he liked bossing and bullying. And though he was a puny little person who couldn't have stood up even to Lucy, let alone Edmund in a fight, he knew that there are dozens of ways to give people a bad time if you are in your own home and they are only visitors. Edmund and Lucy did not at all want to come and stay with Uncle Harold and Aunt Alberta, but it really couldn't be helped. Father had got a job lecturing in America for 16 weeks that summer, and mother was to go with him because she hadn't had a real holiday for 10 years. Peter was working very hard for an exam, and he was to spend the holidays being coached by old Professor Kirk, in whose house these four children had had wonderful adventures long ago in the war years. If he had still been in that house, he would have that, had them all to stay. But he had somehow become poor since the old days and was living in a small cottage with only one bedroom to spare. It would have cost too much money to take the other three all to America and Susan had gone. Grown-ups thought her pretty had thought her the pretty one of the family, and she was no good at schoolwork, though otherwise very old for her age. 
and mother said she would get far more out of a trip to America than the youngsters. Edmund and Lucy tried not to grudge Susan her luck, but it was dreadful having to spend the summer holidays at their aunt's. But it's far worse for me, said Edmund, because you'll at least have a room of your own, and I shall have to share a bedroom with that record stinker, Eustace. All right, let me show you a picture of Eustace Clarence. Do you see down at the bottom? These pictures down here are uh, the beetles, dead beetles stuck to the paper. And next to him is the book. They referred to how he loves books that have information. And I'm guessing behind him is a jar with bugs in it. But we already get that he likes to boss uh, his cousins around and he's kind of a bully. Okay. The story begins on an afternoon when Edmund and Lucy were stealing a few precious minutes alone together. And of course, they were talking about Narnia, which is the name of their own private and secret country. Most of us, I suppose, have a secret country. But for most of us, it is only an imaginary country. Here, let me open this for a sec. I want to be able to see all of you. Edmund and Lucy were luckier than other people in that respect. Their secret country was real. They had already visited it twice, not in a game or a dream, but in reality. They had got there, of course, by magic, which is the only way of getting to Narnia. And a promise, or a very nearly a promise, had been made them in Narnia itself that they would someday get back. You may imagine that they talked about it a good deal when they got the chance. They were in Lucy's room, sitting on the edge of her bed and looking at a picture on the opposite wall. Take this off. There we go. Um, sorry. It was the only picture in the house that they liked. Aunt Alberta didn't like it at all. That was why it was put away in a little back room upstairs, but she couldn't get rid of it because it had been a wedding present from someone she did not want to offend. It was a picture of a ship, a ship sailing straight toward you. Her prow was gilded and shaped like the head of a dragon with wide open mouth. Here's the picture of the ship here. She had only one mast and one large square sail, which was a rich purple. The sides of this ship, what you could see of them, where the gilded wings of the dragon ended, were green. Do you see that? She had just run up to the top of the one glorious blue wave and the nearer slope of that wave came down toward you with streaks and bubbles on it. She was obviously running fast before a gay wind listing over a little on her port side. By the way, if you're going to read this story at all and you don't know already, you had better get it into your head that the left of a ship when you are looking forward is a port and the right is starboard. All the sunlight fell on her from that side and the water on that side was full of greens and purples. On the other, it was darker blue from the shadow of the ship. The question is, said Edmund, whether it doesn't make things worse looking at a Narnian ship when you can't get there. Even looking is better than nothing, said Lucy, and she is such a very Narnian ship. Still playing your old game, said Eustace Clarence, who had been listening outside the door and now came grinning into the room. Last year, when he had been staying with all the Pavensies, he had managed to hear them all talking about Narnia, and he loved teasing them about it. He thought, of course, that they were making it all up, as he was far too stupid to make anything up himself. 
he did not approve of that. You're not wanted here, said Edmund curtly. I'm trying to think of a limerick, said Eustace, something like this. Some kids who played games about nar <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get a limerick. Some kids who played games about Narnia gradually got balmier and balmier. Well, Narnia and balmier don't rhyme to begin with, said Lucy. It's an assonance, said Eustace. Don't ask him what a assy thingy gummy is, said Edmund. He's only longing to be asked. Say nothing and perhaps he'll go away. Most boys on meeting a reception like this would either have cleared up or flared up. Eustace did neither. He just hung about grinning and presently began talking again. Do you like that picture, he asked. For heaven's sake, don't let him get started about art and all that, said Edmund hurriedly. But Lucy, who is very truthful, had already said, yes, I do, I like it very much. It's a rotten picture, said Eustace. You won't see it if you step outside, said Edmund. <laughs> Why do you like it, said Eustace to Lucy. Well, for one thing, said Lucy, I like it because the ship looks as if it were really moving and the water looks as if it were really wet and the waves look as if they really were going up and down. Of course, Eustace knew lots of answers to this, but he didn't say anything. Remember, Eustace is very sciency and not very imaginative. Uh, Eustace knew lots of answers to this, but he didn't say anything. The reason was that at that very moment, he looked at the waves and saw that they did look very much indeed as if they were going up and down. He had only once been in a ship and then only as far as the Isle of Wight and then had been horribly seasick. The look of the waves in the picture made him feel sick again. He turned rather green and tried another look, meaning he glanced at it again. And then all three children were staring with open mouths. What they were seeing may be hard to believe when you read it in print, but it was almost as hard to believe when you saw it happening. The things in the picture were moving. It didn't look at all like cinema either. The colors were too real and clean and out of doors for that. Down went the prow of the ship into the wave and up went a great shock of spray. And then up went the wave behind her and her stern and her deck became visible for the first time and then disappeared as the next wave came to meet her and her bows went up again. At the same time, an exercise book, which had been lying beside Edmund on the bed, lapped, rose and sailed through the air to the wall behind him. And Lucy felt all of her hair whipping around her face as it does on a windy day. And this was a windy day, but the wind was blowing out of the picture toward them. And suddenly with the wind came the noises, the swishing of waves and the slap of water against the ship's sides and the creaking and the overall high steady roar of air and water. But it was the smell, the wild briny smell, which really convinced Lucy that she was not dreaming. Stop it, came Eustace's voice, squeaky and fright with bad temper. It's some silly trick you two are playing. Stop it. I'll tell Alberta. Ow! The other two were much more accustomed to adventures. But just exactly as Eustace Clarence said, ow, they both said, ow, too. The reason was that a great cold salt splash had broken right out of the frame and they were breathless from the smack of it, besides being wet through. I'll smash the rotten thing, cried Eustace, and then several things happened at the same time. Eustace rushed toward the picture. Edmund, who knew something about magic, sprang after him, warning him to look out and not to be a fool. Lucy grabbed at him from the other side and was dragged forward, and by this time, 
either they had grown much smaller or the picture had grown bigger. Eustace jumped to try to pull it off the wall and found himself standing on the frame. In front of him was not glass, but real sea and wind and waves rushing up to the frame as they might to a rock. He lost his head and clutched at the other two who had jumped up beside him. There was a second of struggling and shouting as just as they thought they had got their balance, a great brew roller surged up around them, swept them off their feet and drew them down into the sea. Eustace's de despairing cry suddenly ended as the water got into his mouth. All right. Let me show you a big picture. And I'm gonna take a sip of my tea while you look at this. Okay. All right. Lucy thanked her lucky stars that she had worked hard at her swimming last summer term. It is true that she would have got on much better if she had used a slower stroke and also that the water felt a great deal colder than it had looked while it was only a picture. Still, she had kept her head and kicked off her shoes as everyone ought to do who falls into deep water in their clothes. She even kept her mouth shut and her eyes open. They were still quite near the ship she saw its green side towering high above them and people looking at her from the deck. Then as one might've suspected, Eustace clutched at her in a panic and down they both went. When they came up again, she saw a white figure diving off the ship's side. Edmund was close beside her now treading water and had caught the arms of the howling Eustace. Then someone else whose face was vaguely familiar slipped an arm under her from the other side. There was a lot of shouting going on from the ship, heads crowding together above the bulwarks, ropes being thrown. Edmund and the stranger were fastening ropes around her. After that followed what seemed a very long delay during which her face got blue and her teeth began chattering. In reality, the delay was not very long. They were waiting till the moment when she could be got on board the ship without being dashed against its side. Even with all their best endeavors, she had a bruised knee when she finally stood, dripping and shivering on the deck. After her, Edmund was heaved up, and then the miserable Eustace. Last of all came the stranger, a golden-headed boy some years older than herself. Ca Caspian! gasped Lucy as soon as she had breath enough. For Caspian it was, Caspian, the boy king of Narnia, whom they had helped to set on the throne during their last visit. Immediately, Edmund recognized him too. All three shook hands and clapped one another on the back with great delight. All right, here's the picture. Aww. So Caspian, Lucy, or maybe this is Caspian and Edmund, because I, I don't think Ed, Caspian's older than Edmund. Maybe he is. And here's Eustace over here. You can see they're on the ship and uh, looks like food or at least hot tea is on the way. All right, let me take another sip. All right. But who is your friend? said Caspian almost at once, turning to Eustace with his cheerful smile. But Eustace was crying much harder than any boy of his age has a right to cry when nothing worse than a wedding, wedding, TT, not wedding, getting married, when nothing worse than a wetting has happened to him and would only yell out, let me go, let me go back. I don't like it. Let you go, said Caspian, but where? Eustace rushed to the ship's side as if, as if he expected to see the picture frame hanging above the sea. 
and perhaps a glimpse of Lucy's bedroom. But what he saw was blue waves flecked with foam and a paler blue sky, both spreading without a break to the horizon. Perhaps we can hardly blame him if his heart sank. He was promptly sick. Remember, he, he was uh, seasick on the first boat he was on. Hey, Ryan Elf, said Caspian to one of the sailors. Bring spiced wine for their majesties. You'll need something to warm you after that dip he called to Edmund and Lucy, their majesties, because they, Peter and Susan, had all been kings and queens of Narnia long before his time. Narnian time flows differently from ours. If you spent a hundred years in Narnia, you would still come back to our world at the very same hour of the very same day on which you left. And then, if you went back to Narnia after spending a week here, you might find that a thousand Narnian years had passed, or only a day, or no time at all. You never know till you get there. Consequently, when the Pen Pevensi children, that's the last name of Susan, Lucy, Edmund, and Peter, the Pevensi children had returned to Narnia last time for their second visit, it was for the Narnians as if King Arthur came back to Britain as some people say he will. And I say the sooner the better. Ryan Nelf returned with the spiced wine steaming in a flagon and four silver cups. A flagon, I guess, is a sort of pitcher. It was just what one wanted. And as Lucy and Edmund sipped it, they could feel the warmth going right down to their toes. But Eustace made faces and sputtered and spat it out and was sick again and began to cry and asked if they hadn't any plump trees vitaminized nerve food and could it be made with distilled water and anyway he insisted on being put ashore at the next station All right let me show you a picture again so uh the name of the guy bringing the spiced wine is Rhinelf, and here he is in the background so he's not a creature at all, like uh, other Narnians. He's a human, just like Prince Caspian. Okay. All right, so Eustace is having trouble and he wants to go back to shore. And he's, he's saying next station because that's what he's accustomed to in his human times, right? This is a merry shipmate you've brought us, brother, whispered Caspian to Edmund with a chuckle. But before he could say anything more, Eustace burst out again. Oh, ugh, what on earth is that? Take it away, the horrid thing. <clears throat> Pardon me. He really had some excuse this time. <clears throat> hey, um, <clears throat> Pardon me. Let me get a sip of my tea. He really had some excuse this time for feeling a little surprised. Something very curious indeed had come out of the cabin in the poop and was slowly approaching them. Okay, poop deck. Uh, Bruce, Bruce, our uh, local sailor. Bruce, okay. can you share with us uh, the definition of poop deck? Poop deck is the lower deck of a boat. Thank you. It's like the kitchen, the bedroom, and also oh. the toilet. Okay, like like the living spaces. The living space. Very cool. Thank you, Bruce, for your service. We will be seeking it again. <laughs> All right. Um. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay. So something very curious indeed had come out of the cabin in the poop and was slowly approaching them. You might call it, and indeed it was, a mouse. But then it was a mouse on its hind legs and stood about two feet high. A thin band of gold passed around its head under one ear and over the other. And in this was stuck a long crimson feather, 
Whoops. Okay, you guys, I'm keeping it muted because because uh, we're recording it and also so you can hear me better. Uh, let's see, let me show you the picture. We know who this is, right? This is Reap It Cheap. Reap It Cheap. Yay. All right. As the mouse's fur was very dark, almost black, the effect was bold and striking. In its left paw rested on the hilt of a sword very nearly as long as its tail. Its balance as it paced gravely along the swaying deck was perfect and its manners courtly. Lucy and Edmund recognized it at once. Reap a cheap, the most valiant of all the talking beasts of Narnia and the chief mouse. It had won underlying, I'm sorry, it had won undying glory in the second battle of Beruna. Lucy longed, as she had always done, to take Reap a Cheap up in her arms and cuddle him. But this, as she well knew, was a pleasure she could never have. It would have offended him so deeply. Instead, she went down on one knee to talk to him. <clears throat> Pardon me. So Reap a Cheap, uh, as, as you know from previous books, Reap a Cheap is a warrior. And as adorable as he is, that's not what he wants to hear. It's like when you have a crush on someone and they look at you instead of going, wow, you're very attractive. They go, oh, aren't you just the cutest thing? <laughs> Friend zone, right? We've all been there. <laughs> Okay, but this is more about uh, royalty and bravery. You know, he's a brave guy. So she went down on one knee to talk with him. Ripachi put forward his left leg, drew back his right, bowed, kissed her hand and straightened himself up, twirled his whiskers and said in his shrill piping voice, my humble duty to your majesty and to King Edmund too. Here he bowed again. Nothing except your majesty's presence was lacking in this glorious venture. Ugh, take it away, wailed Eustace. I hate mice and I never could bear performing on animals. They're silly and vulgar and sentimental. Am I to understand said Reba Cheap to Lucy after a long stare at Eustace, that this singularly discourteous person is under your majesty's protection? Because if not, at this moment, Lucy and Edmund both sneezed. What a fool I am to keep you all standing here in your wet things, said Caspian. Come on below and we'll get changed. I'll give you my cabin, of course, Lucy, but I'm afraid we have no women's clothes on board. You'll have to make do with some of mine. Lead the way, Reap a Cheap, like a good fellow. To the convenience of a lady, said Reap a Cheap, even a question of honor must give way, at least for the moment. And here he looked very hard at Eustace. But Caspian hustled them on, and in a few minutes, Lucy found herself passing through the door into the stern cabin. She fell in love with it at once. The three square windows that looked out onto the blue swirling water astern, the low cushioned benches around three sides of the table, the swinging silver lamp overhead, dwarf's work, she knew at once by its exquisite delicacy and the flat gold image of Aslan the lion on the forward wall above the door. All this she took in in a flash for Caspian immediately opened the door on the starboard side and said, this'll be your room, Lucy. I'll just get some dry things for myself. He was rummaging in one of the lockers while he spoke. And then I'll leave you to change. If you'll fling your wet things outside the door, I'll get them taken to the galley to be dried. Lucy found herself as much at home as if she had been in Caspian's cabin for weeks. And the motion of the ship did not worry her, for in old days, when she had been a queen in Narnia, she had done a good deal of voyaging. 
The cabin was very tiny, but bright with painted panels, all birds and beasts and crimson dragons and vines. Cool, so that's, that's on the mural. And spotlessly clean. Caspian's clothes were too big for her, but she could manage. His shoes, sandals, and sea boots were hopelessly big, but she did not mind going barefoot on board ship. When she had finished dressing, she looked out of her window at the water, rushing past and took a long, deep breath. She felt quite sure they were in for a lovely time. Cool, let me show you this cool little cabin. It makes me want to go uh, spend some time on a boat. For uh, one of my birthdays, some friends, uh, my neighbor had a, uh, a big sailboat. I don't know how many feet, but it was my, it was a big birthday, like 35th or something like that. And um, we sailed over to Catalina and we all spent the night on the boat best night of sleep in my life because it just kind of anyway okay so she felt quite sure they were in for a lovely time all right chapter two on board the dawn treader all right 1051 okay 52 we have about 20 minutes all right, um, let me move things around a little bit so that you can all see this. All right. Ah, there you are, said Caspian. We were just waiting for you. This is my captain, the Lord Drinian. A dark-haired man went down on one knee. Liz, are you trying to get my attention? In, in my book, it shows this. The different picture? Um, no, not for the chapter, but here, I'll show you. A little higher. Um, little to the other direction, a little bit this way. Cool. Where is that? It's the front, or it's the oh. boat, but it, it shows like the different words and stuff. Oh, right. Okay. Like the poop deck and the starboard and oh, all of cool. that. Oh, cool. Okay. Let me see. Is that in the back? Oh, it was, here we go. It's in the yeah. It's in the very beginning. I think. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. Because what I usually like to do also <laughs> is show the uh, the map so that people get an idea. Yeah, of, it's um, yeah. Mine has the map too, and then it's a few pages after that. Okay. Cool. All right. Here we go. All right, I don't know. Are the words showing backwards? Or are they in the right order? I mean, you know what I mean? Like mirrored or are they correct? <laughs> They're correct. Oh, okay, thank you, Bruce. All right, okay. Thank you, Liz. All right, let's carry on. There we go. And yeah, if, uh, if anybody else is reading along, I do encourage it, okay? All right, uh, so here we go. A dark haired man, this is Lord Drinian that uh, Caspian's referring to. And he said, this is his captain. So this is the guy that runs the ship. A dark haired man went down on one knee and kissed Lucy's hand. The only other present were Reepicheep and Edmund. Where is Eustace? asked Lucy. In bed, said Edmund, and I don't think we can do anything for him. It only makes him worse if you try to be nice to him. Meanwhile, said Caspian, we want to talk. By Jove, we do, said Edmund, and first about time. It's a year ago by our time since we left you just before your coronation. How long has it been in Narnia? Exactly three years. 
said Caspian. All going well? asked Edmund. You don't suppose I'd have left my kingdom and put to sea unless all was well, answered the king. It couldn't be better. There's no trouble at all now between telmarines, dwarfs, talking beasts, fawns, and the rest. And we gave those troublesome giants on the frontier such a good beating last summer that they pay us tribute now. And I had an excellent person to leave as regent while I'm away. Trumpkin, the dwarf. Do you remember him? Dear Trumpkin, said Lucy, of course I do. You couldn't have made a better choice. Loyal as a badger, ma'am, and valiant as, as a mouse, said Drinian. He had been going to say as a lion, but had noticed the reaper chief's eyes fixed on him. And where are we headed for? asked Edmund. Well, said Caspian, that's a rather long story. Perhaps you remember that when I was a child, my usurping, usurping uncle Miraz got rid of seven friends of my father's who might have taken my part by sending them off to explore the unknown eastern seas beyond the Lone Islands. Yes, said Lucy, and none of them ever came back. Right. Well, on my coronation day with Oslan's approval, I swore an oath that if once I established peace in Narnia, I would sail east myself for a year and a day to find my father's friends or to learn of their deaths and avenge them if I could. These were their names, the Lord Rev Rev Revillian, the Lord Byrne, the Lord Argos, the Lord Mavramorn, the Lord... Octesian, the Lord Restamar, and oh, that other one who's so hard to remember. The Lord Roop, sire, said Drinian. Roop, Roop, of course, said Caspian. That is my main intention. But Reap a Cheap here has an even higher hope. Everyone's eyes turned to the mouse. As high as my spirit, it said though perhaps as small as my stature. Why should we not come to the very eastern end of the world? And what might we find there? I expect to find Aslan's own country. It's always from the east, always across the sea that the great lion comes to us. I say, that is an idea, said Edmund in an, an, odd, vo oh, in an odd voice. Awe, A-W-E-D, meaning awesome. Like he's in awe, like wow, right? But do you think, said Lucy, Oslan's country would be that sort of country? I mean, the sort you could ever sail to. I do not know, madam, said Reepa Cheep, but there is this, when I was in my cradle, a wood woman, a dryad, spoke this verse over me. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not, reap it cheap, to find all you seek. There is the other east. Utter. I'm not mispronouncing other. U-T-T-E-R. There is the utter east. I do not know what it means, but the spell of it has been on me all my life, said Rita Cheap. After a short silence, Lucy asked, and where are we now, Caspian? The captain can tell you better than I, said Caspian. So Drinian got out his chart and spread it on the table. That's our position, he said, lying his finger on it, or was at noon today? We had a fair wind from Care Paravel and stood a little north for Galma, which we made on the next day. We were in port for a week, for the Duke of Galma made a great tournament for his majesty, and there he unhorsed many knights. And got a few nasty falls myself, Drinian. Some of the bruises are still there, put in Caspian. So a tournament, they did some sort of display of skills on horses and whatnot. Um, and that's- It's like Renaissance Fair. Oh, say it again, Bruce. 
It's like the Renaissance Fair with the tournaments and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, he got a few nasty falls. Some of the bruises are still there, put in Caspian. And unhorsed many nights, repeated Drenian with a grin. We thought the Duke would have been pleased if the King's Majesty would have married his daughter, but nothing came of that. Squints and has freckles, said Caspian. Oh, poor girl, said Lucy. I beg your pardon. I have freckles and I squint when I don't wear my glasses. <laughs> oh, poor girl, said Lucy. And we sailed from Galma, continued Drinian and ran into calm for the best part of two days and had to row, then had a wind again and did not make Terabenitha until the fourth day from Galma. And there, their king sent out a warning not to land for there was sickness in Terabenitha. But we doubled the cape and put in a little creek far from the city and watered. Then, because, you know, they've got to stop at each uh, port when possible and get fresh water. So it's great that on land, as long as they're being honest, that they said, sorry, don't come here. We're all sick. We're all sick. You don't want to get it and put it on your boat. And we're quarantined. We know that word, right? So then um, what they're saying is they pulled into a freshwater creek and they were able to bathe and get buckets of fresh water for survival, right? Okay, so uh, then we had to lie off for three days before we got a southeast wind and stood out for seven aisles. So they didn't have good wind. They had to kind of hang around until they had good wind. Uh, the third day out, a pirate, Tara Benethan by her rig, overhauled us, but when she saw us well-armed, she stood off after some shooting of arrows on either part. And we ought to have given her a chase and boarded her and hanged every mother's son of them, said Reepa Cheep. See, they were more peaceful than that. And in five days more, we were inside of Mule, which as you know, is the westernmost of the Seven Isles. Then we rode through the straits and came about sundown into Red Haven on the Isle of Bren, where we were very love, lovingly feasted and had victuals and water at will. We left Red Haven six days ago and have made marvelous good speed, so that I hope to see the Lone Islands the day after tomorrow. The sum is we are now nearly 30 days at sea and have sailed more than 400 leagues from Narnia. And after the Lone Islands, asked Lucy. No one knows, your majesty, answered Drinian, unless the Lone Islanders themselves can tell us. They couldn't in our days, said Edmund. Then, said Reepicheep, it is after the Lone Islands that the adventure really begins. Because remember, uh, for them to just set out and not have a destination, they've got water to think about. Because out there, all they have otherwise is salt water. Okay, Caspian now suggested that they might like to be shown over the ship before supper. But Lucy's conscience smote her. I don't know what smote means. We'll look it up. And she said, I think I really must go and see Eustace. Sickness or seasickness is horrid, you know. If I had my old cordial with me, I could cure him. But you have, said Caspian. I'd quite forgotten about it. As you left it behind, I thought it might be regarded as one of the royal treasures. And so I brought it. If you think it ought to be wasted on a thing like seasickness, it'll only take a drop, said Lucy. Caspian opened one of the lockers beneath the bench and brought out the beautiful little diamond flask, which Lucy remembered so well. Take back your own, queen, he said. 
They then left the cabin and went out in the sunshine. In the deck, there were two large, long hatches, fore and aft of the mast, and both open, as they always were in fair weather, to let light and air into the belly of the ship. Caspian led them down a ladder into the hatch, or into the after hatch. Here, they found themselves in a place where benches for rowing ran from side to side, and the light came in through the oar holes and danced on the roof. Of course, Caspian's ship was not that horrible thing, a galley rowed by slaves. Oars were used only when the wind failed or for getting in and out of the harbor. And everyone except Ripachip, whose legs were too short, had often taken a turn. At each side of the ship, the space under the benches was left clear for the rowers' feet but all down the center, there was a kind of pit which went down to the very keel. And this was filled with all kinds of things, sacks of flour, casks of water and beer, barrels of pork, jars of honey, skin bottles. That's like the little um, bottles that you see that are covered like with uh, like fur, but they're like little flasks, you know, and they usually have a, um, a strap around them. Uh, okay, very cute, all kinds of things. Skin bottles of wine, apples, nuts, cheeses, biscuits, turnips, sides of bacon. From the roof, that is, from the underside of the deck, hung hams and strings of onions, and also the men of the watch off duty in their hammocks. Caspian led them aft, stepping from bench to bench. At least it was stepping for him and something between a step and a jump for Lucy and a real long jump for Ripachip. In this way, they came to a partition with a door in it. Caspian opened the door and led them into a cabin, which filled the stern underneath the deck's cabins in the poop. It was, of course, not so nice. It was very low and the sides sloped together as they went down so that there was hardly any floor. And though it had windows of thick glass, they were not made to open because they were underwater. In fact, at this very moment, as the ship pitched, they were alternately golden with sunlight, then dim with the green of the sea. You and I must lodge here, Edmund, said Caspian. We'll leave your kinsmen in the bunk and sling hammocks for ourselves. All right, do you want to see the picture? I don't know if that's super, uh, you see someone's in bed over here. Uh, here are the drawers. Um, so this is where they're going to have to, okay, who keeps, uh, spend the night. uh, this is where they're, they're going to have to spend the night because, um, they gave Lucy, the lady, uh, Caspian's cabin. What time is it? Is it time to go? Okay. It's 10 Oh nine. So, uh, we're going to leave it on chat on page 26. If you're reading along in this same book that I have. And we're on the phrase, you and I, oops, what was that? And we're, we left on the phrase, you and I must lodge here, Edmund. Okay, page 26. And again, you guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be um, posting these on YouTube. All right. So if you miss or you want to go back and listen, you have that. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to unmute everybody. Uh, there we go. All right. If anybody, ha does anyone have anything they want to say about it? I, I do. I do, oh, Julie. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Ben. That's her awesome story. Hang on, you guys. I'm trying Bye, to phone. you. Oh, okay. Good. Thank oh. you, Ben. I agree with you. It's you, going to be another good one. Oh. Hey. Matt, Emily, happy Chinese New Year, Tay. 
Yeah, yeah. Happy Chinese New Year, Ben. Hi, hi, happy Chinese New Year, Emily. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Bye. All right, you guys, go take a break. We're getting weird sounds. So. Bye, bye, bye. Yeah. <laughs>